so I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Alexandra Sims. I want to welcome you all to the confinement session and to this workshop today. Uh, just for those of you who have no idea why I'm speaking, because I know you're all here for Vlad, um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Alexandra Sims. I'm one of the co-organizers of this event, along with uh, the other beautiful people on this, uh, in the panel that you see in the different videos. Uh, I am a marketeer, uh, but I do have a soft spot for all things technology. And since we've been in lockdown here in Spain, where I'm based, I've become a little bit of a chef and a fitness guru. So you can see I have put some really big uh, guns lately in the, in the last few weeks. Um, and before we begin, I just wanted to share a little, it's, it's a little sad. Today would have been the day that we would have all been meeting together at Jay and the Beach here in Malaga. And we're disappointed that we can't host the event as we planned, but um, you guys are actually not missing out too much because the skies are gray and it's been raining the last few days. So maybe it was actually better that we uh, had to postpone until October. In any case, um, we all know why we're here. The purpose of Jane the Beach is to create a space where people come together to exchange knowledge. And as a purely technology driven event, we weren't going to let you down during this time. So whether you're in full lockdown, you're in social distancing, smart distancing, or entering some weird form of a zombie apocalypse, we want to welcome you here today and uh, thank you for attending. This is the first, if this is your first workshop with us, please look out for more interesting talks that we're going to have uh, in June. And we're even considering organizing more events until we're all together in person. So check our website out, check out our site, uh, our profile on LinkedIn and Twitter so you can get all of the updates. Before we get started, I wanted to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors who have continued to support the event, even though we've, uh, we've postponed it until October. And thank you for to all of you, all of our attendees who have maintained your enthusiasm and we're really, really excited to see you in October. And lastly, um, let's not forget our speakers who remain committed to Jan on the Beach, like Vlad, who's here with us today. I don't know if you guys can spot his picture here. Um, not only are they still accompanying us in the physical event, but all of our speakers are, a lot of our speakers will be hosting the, the virtual talks in the next months. And like I mentioned, uh, we do have a number of events coming up. The next one is on June 10th. We have four talks from four different speakers for the apocalypse session. So make sure to check out our website or check us out on Twitter and we can, um, and you can purchase your tickets for that next session here. And if you like what you see today, if you like what Vlad's showing you, please make sure to tag us um, using our Twitter handle, JOTB2020, or on any of your social media channels using the hashtag virtualJOTB20. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to present Vlad Mihalcha. I hope that I speak pronounce that correctly. He is the CEO at Hypersistence and he's a Java champion, the creator of Hypersistence Optimizer and the author of Hypersformance Java Persistence. Other than that, his passions include enterprise systems, data access frameworks, and distributed systems. So Vlad, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and let you carry on with your workshop and take us all away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, I'm, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. So I hope, uh, so do you see it? I'm not sure if, uh, oh, so one second. Uh, no. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get it going. So uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining, uh, joining this uh, workshop. We're going to talk about uh, what is the best way to fetch data when using uh, not just JPA and Hibernate, but Java, JDBC, and uh, any other uh, 
all this knowledge applies even to other programming languages. I'm going to skip about this presentation because I, I've been already uh, been introduced. Most of you know me probably from my website, vladimhalcha.com. When you are searching something about Hibernate, uh, uh, I've been working a lot so that you, you land up on my site. Uh, so basically that's probably where most of you got to, got to know me. Now we're going to, uh, in these two hours, we're going to go through a lot of uh, topics now, uh, if you have questions after I'm going to finish uh, any of the following sections, uh, you can write in the QA section on Zoom and then uh, after I'm finishing uh, a section, I'm going to pick some questions and uh, answer, answer them for you. And also at the end of the, of the workshop, we're going to, we're going to answer uh, even more questions. Now there, there is going to be a, a part which is uh, both theoretically and uh, th theoretical and also all the code that uh, is presented in this workshop uh, you can find it um, you can find it also on github so uh, it's all already so if you go to github to my account uh, you can see it it's uh, the second repository the third repository this high performance java persistence you can uh, you can just uh, um, clone or download it and then uh, if you're using IntelliJ IDI, it's pretty simple. You just uh, you can just import it from Maven now because uh, it's it can work. It has a branch for Java 8 if you're still stuck with the old Java versions, but also the master branch works with Java 13, and there's also a branch for uh, Java 14 for records. Uh, now uh, it's quite easy to set up. It's uh, in the project README. Uh, you can find there more uh, details about uh, how you can uh, you can set it up. You don't have to do it today, you can also do it uh, afterwards. Okay, now the, the first thing that I wanted to talk about, because th this is a lesser known thing, uh, most of the time when we're using JPA Hibernate, and nowadays you're not even using directly JP, uh, JPA, you're using Spring Data, uh, JPA, uh, we kind of we, we uh, forget that underneath everything, uh, everything flows uh, through JDBC, and there are some, Things uh, which are fundamental, but and if you and if we don't uh, know about them, uh, then we are going to lose some opportunities or, uh, to optimize the code, or we are going to misuse some features. Like, the, for instance, it's the case of uh, streaming. And one of these is this statement. Uh, the JDBC statement has this fetch size property, and we will see that uh, depending on the underlying JDBC driver. Uh, you could either set it, it's uh, either uh, mandatory to set it or we can just skip it and set it uh, only on some specific use cases. And for instance, uh, if you're using Oracle, the default statement fetch size is 10. So what does it mean? It means that you have, if you're running a query and you select 100 uh, records, if, you, if the result set has 100 records, the driver has to go 10 times to the database in order to, to fetch all the data. However, uh, if you're using JP and Hibernate, you are always going to consume all that data. It's just that you are going to go uh, 10 times to, to the database to fetch it because the result set is always traversed by Hibernate in order to give you, to give you a list of DTOs or entities. So if you're using Oracle, it's a good idea to, to change this uh, default statement fetch size and try to increase it to 50 or 100 or something like that. Also, you have to keep in mind that if you're... Uh, Using if you're using Oracle and you started a project, let's say five, ten years ago, there's a very good chance that you haven't updated the JDBC driver because most of the time that rarely happens. Uh, the thing is that just like any other framework or program or system, uh, even the driver itself is being updated from time to time, and uh, there are bugs that are fixed, there are optimizations that are being done. Uh, to the driver and uh, it's uh, what's nice about uh, this oracle driver is that even if you're using uh, an older oracle version you can still use a newer jdbc driver and it's still it's still going to work because it's both forward and backward compatible now why would you want to do that for instance in this case for oracle since oracle 12 there's a much better memory allocation scheme using by the driver so that's uh, that's why uh, i uh, reminded you about this now, if you're using SQL Server, I'm going to mention the default Microsoft JDBC driver. Uh, previously, uh, if you've been using SQL Server with Java 
um, there's a chance that uh, you might uh, have used uh, the JTDS driver. Now it's no longer needed because uh, the default Microsoft driver is now open source. It's on GitHub and it's being uh, maintained. Uh, the default statement batch size in this uh, in this case is 128, which is uh, not bad. It's, and uh, the SQL Server uses also adapt adaptive buffering so that uh, uh, it doesn't have to use uh, uh, um, a fixed window size of 128. So by default, it, there uh, it's not necessary. Uh, it's, it's not really necessary to change uh, this statement batch size. Now for Postgres for PostgreSQL. Which is a, is a very popular open source database. Uh, by default, everything, if you're running a query, everything is being prefetched on the JDBC driver. So there's only a single database round trip that fetches all the data. Even if you don't uh, iterate the resource set, you're still go going to get uh, all of it. Because of this, you want, uh, if you're using get resource stream, as we will see towards the end of this uh, workshop, uh, you might want to uh, you 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 might want to to change this strategy. Otherwise, you are going to get all the data, even if you're not going to consume all of it from uh, from from the stream. In the same uh, this, in the, in the same way, the MySQL driver prefetches everything, just like PostgreSQL. So if you want if you want to stream, if you're using uh, Java streams or the Hibernate scroll method. Then in that case, uh, you have two options. Either you are setting the fetch size to integer minimum value, uh, which according to the documentation, they say that they're going to uh, stream uh, only one entry at a time. In reality, there is some prefetching going on there, but basically that's uh, the principle um, that it works. Or, or for instance, if you're also setting the use cursor fetch connection property, then you have the option to, to set uh, uh, a custom fetch size, for instance, you can give a value of 50, and then you are going to uh, get from the database 50, 50 mm -hmm. entries uh, at a time. So basically, that's uh, how this statement fetch size works uh, behind the scene. Now, if you're using Hibernate, the advantage uh, that you have is uh, you can see there is only one property, a global property that you can set, and you can override the default fetch size. Now, for if you're using Postgres and MySQL, probably you don't want to do that, but for Oracle, it's a good idea to increase the default fetch size, which is just then to something that's uh, uh, larger, like 50 or 100. And for instance, if you're using uh, streams, you also want to, to give a custom fetch size on a per query basis, uh, because you don't want to, for instance, if you're using uh, MySQL, you don't want to prefetch uh, everything, because uh, that can lead to all sorts of problems, like out of memory issues or, um, garbage collection issues. Now, why I mentioned this is because uh, the statement fetch size uh, has a significant impact. For instance, in this, what you see now on the screen, uh, the, there, there is a test case which fetches 10,000 10, records, and if you vary the fetch size from 1 to 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000, you can see that the response time decreases significantly. Why? Because for the first uh, for the first one, when the fetch size is one, it needs ten thousand round trips. But then, if the fetch size is ten, you are going to need one thousand round trips. You are going to save nine nine times, so, or you are going to uh, fetch everything uh, with uh, ninety percent less uh, be, uh, uh, less round trips. So that's why you can see that the fetch. Uh, size dec uh, decreases significantly. So basically, what you have to keep in mind here is that uh, if you're using Oracle, it's a good idea to, to uh, increase the statement face size. Otherwise, it might take uh, multiple round trips and that uh, could uh, hurt uh, performance. Now, uh, let's see if we have some que uh, Q and A question. Let's see if I can uh, figure it out how to. Okay, so please, Ian, okay. Two questions, what is the best method? Okay, so we are going to address uh, some of the questions uh, in the next, uh, uh, the one about uh, eh, some of them, not, not, not all of them. I'm going, I'm going to l l leave out uh, all the questions that are not strictly related to what we're going through, and uh, I'm going to answer them at the end uh, of uh, this uh, workshop. Memory management, are there any doubt? Okay, so except of the possibility of me memory management problems, are there any 
other downsides of using a bigger or max fetch size. No, there are not uh, really any downsides uh, related. Now, if you're using Postgres and MySQL, the default statement fetch size uh, makes sense if you're using JP and Hibernate. The only time when you want to override it and you want to do it on a per query basis is, for instance, if you're using stream. Uh, now, we will see at the end that even streams are not really uh, the best options because pagination is going to render much better, uh, much better, uh, it's going to be much more efficient. Okay, so why would you set fetch size to integer minimum value if it's negative, why not one? Because yeah, you're asking this question uh, uh, about MySQL, because that's the way MySQL driver was implemented, integer minimum value doesn't have any logical value, it's just a value, it's just a, let's, it's a magic value that they picked uh, in order to uh, instruct, uh, in order to instruct the driver that uh, you want to you want to stream, you don't want to fetch uh, everything. Now, if you set it to one, that's actually going to. Uh, if you're setting to, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the, the difference between minimum value and one is if you're setting to minimum value, then you are hinting the driver that you want to do streaming, and it's going to use some prefetching in advance, uh, 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 pre prefetching in advance. So I'm not sure. So probably there are some optimization probably there that uh, they are doing uh, uh, there. Now, if you're setting to one and you don't set use cursor fetch, uh, I, I believe that it's not going to work. So by default, even if you're changing the the, cu the custom fetch size and you don't provide the use cursor fetch connection property, uh, this, uh, this uh, custom fetch size uh, might be ignored. Okay, now in, if you remember the previous test case uh, which I showed you, uh, had, uh, was trying to fetch 10,000 records. Now you, you, you must think about it. Most of the time, you don't really need to fetch uh, that much data. If, you ha if you're having a, an, a UI, like for even if you're having a, a web application, you cannot, you don't, you don't need to fetch 10,000 uh, records because those will never fit on the screen because you have a limited viewport, you have a limited size, so it doesn't make sense to fetch that much data. Or, for instance, if you're using a mobile phone, the problem is even bigger because not only that uh, you have a smaller screen, but if you're on data, not on, on Wi-Fi, then the more data you are fetching, the more you are going to pay. So uh, actually you don't uh, really need to fetch all, all, all that data. Even if you're using a batch processing task, uh, that's why it's called batch processing because it's much, uh, it's much better if you're operating on smaller batches than fetching everything from the database just to process it uh, in the application memory. So what, so what you can use in this sense, uh, you can uh, use pagination. Now there are multiple options that you have, uh, that you have here. Um, the most efficient, as you will see, is uh, still the SQL level pagination, the top end. And uh, since um, uh, the SQL standard 2008, now there is a standard pagination syntax, which is based on uh, two, um, two clauses. One is fetch first and the other one is offset rows. Uh, that's supported by Oracle since version 12, SQL Server since 2012 and PostgreSQL for quite a lot of time. Only if you're using MySQL, uh, this uh, standard pagination syntax is not uh, going to be supported. Now, if you're using uh, the standard pagination, it's, look, uh, it's quite simple. So uh, in order to just fetch the first, let's say the first five rows, you're going to just have to, to provide fetch first five rows only. Now, what's very important about uh, when you're doing pagination, you also have to, to, to use an order by close because if you're not using order by, uh, there, is, there is no guarantee about how the result that is going to be sorted. So it's actually based on how the execution plan is executed and how the extractor fetches the data based on the current execution plan. And even if you observe some particular ordering that can change if the plan changes, or for instance, if you're running uh, the same query on the production system, there's a good chance, uh, chance that the, the plan changes so the only reasonable way of to ensure a certain uh, a sorting criteria is to use order by. And if you want to uh, use an offset, so while uh, fetch next, uh, while fetch, um, uh, the fetch clause limits how many rows are going to be fetched, offset tells 
what's the position where to start streaming data. So it's just a way to give you the next, uh, the next pages. Okay, so now if you're not using the default, uh, if you're not using Oracle 12, maybe you're stuck with some uh, older Oracle version, this is how, this is the syntax for, for, for a top end query. Now you might think, why do you need this derived table or this inline view in order to do the pagination? And the reason why you have the query, it must be written like this, is because the row number is calculated prior to executing the order by close. That's why you need to run the first query with the order by close to impose the ordering and only uh, then the row number will be assigned and then you can, uh, you can uh, just take the first top end records that you are interested in. Now, according to the SQL standard, you also have to, to provide a second order by uh, close for the outer query, because if you don't do that, uh, then uh, it's not guaranteed that the order is going to be maintained. Now, if you're running it and testing it, you'll see that the order is actually maintained because for compatibility reasons, but uh, according to the standards, uh, this uh, is, uh, it's not guaranteed and could actually change uh, in future in the in the future now if you want to do a next end query now you have to use uh, three uh, queries which are in line uh, and uh, what the advantage of using hibernate is that you don't really need to to do those but it's uh, important to to understand what's uh, how how this uh, works uh, anyway so here the first query does the sorting then you have the second uh, the, the middle query which actually does the limit and then you have the last one which applies uh, which applies the offset. For SQL Server, the top end query is quite simple. You just have to use the top, uh, the top command. And you can also have the option of uh, providing the percent keyword which not, is not going to take an absolute value. It's going to just take the, the, 5 the first 5% of the entire result set. And for the next 10, in this case, you will have to use a, a window function, the row number window function, to assign the row number values, just like in Oracle, in order to specify what's the window that you want to fetch from five, for instance, to 10, in this case. For PostgreSQL and MySQL, uh, it's the, the syntax is the same. You just have to use limit if you want to restrict the result set size, and if you want to specify an offset, you can also give the offset uh, clause. It's unfortunate that the standard doesn't use this uh, syntax because it's much uh, easier to understand and less verbose, but uh, it is what it is. Now, if you, uh, for, for instance, if you're using JPA or, uh, directly or through other um, methods, you have these uh, two methods, set max results, which actually works like a limit, and set first results, which works like an offset. So even if your JPQL query doesn't contain the pagination syntax, uh, using these two methods, uh, can, you can apply, uh, automatically the pagination is applied. In this case, it was MySQL or PostgreSQL, and you can see that uh, the syntax is applied. But it doesn't only work, it, it doesn't only work for, uh, for um, JPQL or Criteria API. It, it works in the same way, even if you provide native SQL query that doesn't have any pagination, and because you have these two methods, the query is going to be rewritten and you're going to see that the pagination syntax is being embedded uh, uh, in, the, in, the SQL, um, in the SQL statement prior to be sent to the database. So that's quite an advantage because as you saw previously, the syntax differs significantly from one database to the other. Uh, so you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, Hibernate can, uh, can take care of that for you. Now, if you remember from the statement, there is a, another option which you have there. So previously we saw that we have that uh, set fetch uh, size. You also have this set max rows settings, which uh, if you uh, read the Java doc, it tells you that uh, it can limit uh, the result set size. So, and if you read further, you'll see that if the limit is exceeded, the access rows are silently dropped. Now, according to the documentation, uh, you might uh, think that this one will uh, fetch all the data and just simply discard whatever is not needed and give, uh, give only uh, the maximum rows that uh, uh, you instructed it to do. Actually, uh, in reality, it's just, uh, just like the fetch size, it just depends from one database to the other. So, for instance, if you're using this with Oracle, there is no execution plan optimization compared to 
limiting uh, the result set size using uh, the SQL clause, but it, it will instruct the optimizer to only fetch uh, the maximum number of records that you uh, told the JDBC driver to do so. For uh, SQL Server, uh, if you take a look of what uh, comments are being uh, executed, once you set the maximum rows, you will see that the driver executes this set row count command. And although it's not documented, actually, if you take a look at the execution plan, it's actually equivalent. So uh, even if you're using a, a top end query or if you're using this uh, option, you are going to get the same result. For PostgreSQL, it's just like in Oracle. Uh, you set this, it only affects the executor, it doesn't uh, affect the execution plan. And for MySQL, uh, there is a command that's being executed and the end result is, be, is going to be equivalent to a top end query. So now, if you compare all these options, why it's important to have this is because, for instance, if you try to fetch uh, many, re uh, many records and you don't put, uh, and you don't impose any uh, restriction on the resource set size, you will see that it takes quite a lot of time to fetch all that data. It takes less time if you're using max rows and the fastest and the most efficient way is to use the SQL level pagination. So basically that's the, the reason why that one is the most efficient uh, option is because not only that it, it, it will instruct the optimizer to fetch less data, but actually it's going to influence the way the execution plan is built because the database will know right from the start that you only want to fetch uh, a limited number of uh, records. So it can, for instance, uh, for this reason, it, it can uh, um, choose to use an index instead of doing a, a full table scan. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see some questions. Oh, how to determine the best size? Uh, I'm not sure what the best size is. The best size for pagination. Usually, the best uh, when you're talking about fetching data, you should just fetch just as much, just, just as much data that um, that, that ju just as much data that uh, you have to fetch on the UI, but not uh, more than that. Would there be any performance gain if fetch size is set to 50 instead of one when the result set has only one record? Uh, no, if, uh, if the result set has only one record and for instance, if you provide uh, uh, a filtering criteria like you select uh, by the ID and you provide a value, the database knows that there is only one record. Uh, maybe it can fetch all the data either entirely from the index or it's going to uh, use the index and just read a single page and then the executor will know that only one record is to be returned. So it doesn't matter whether the fetch size is one or 50, because in the end you're still going to get uh, a single record. On the graphic that you display, there is several graphic, and what does, uh, what, what, what those um, databases mean? Okay, so the database names are obfuscated for many reasons. One of the reasons is legal, so you're not allowed to, uh, to publish comparison benchmarks when some of the databases are commercial. This is called the debit clause. So I'm, uh, not all of you have uh, read the license uh, uh, of the commercial uh, relational database, but it's a good idea to, to read it. You're not allowed to do this comparison database. So if you want to, uh, to display such benchmark, you have to obfuscate the names. And the other reason is because uh, you might draw the wrong conclusions comparing one database to the other because what I want you to see is how uh, how an optimization affects and you can what gain you will get from using something uh, because absolute numbers are not relevant here. What's in, important to see that there's a uh, there is an advantage and there is uh, you are going to get something in return. Of course, if you're going to measure on your machine, you're going to get different numbers. So absolute values are not so uh, relevant. So if you use JP or CRUD. Will the Hibernate fetch size be applied? Yes, it will be applied. Uh, it will be applied because JPL CRUD repository is just one abstraction uh, above JPL and Hibernate. So whatever you are setting in Spring that goes to JPL or Hibernate is going to work in the same way. Order by clause is not used in Spring Boot pagination. How does it work without order by? Uh, yes, it's going to. Uh, in Spring Boot pagination, if you're using the default one, it uses also order by. If you're not using order by, then of course you're not going to get uh, uh, meaningful uh, 
any meaningful um, uh, results. Now, I presented you, uh, now, if you, if, you, if you think of a query that fetches data in a tabular fashion, it's like, uh, it's like an Excel spreadsheet, uh, the pagination applies, um, limits the table, for instance, on uh, the verticals of the number of uh, records that you're going to fetch, but also the number of columns that you are fetching when you're executing a query is going to affect performance. And for that, uh, the answer in SQL for that is called projection. For instance, the difference be between selecting all columns when you're, when you're issuing a query like this one, which selects from uh, a table post comment, which joins a table post, which joins another table post, uh, called post details. If you're running this query, which is, which is quite, uh, uh, quite often you are going to issue a query like that, for instance, if you're uh, using JPQL or even Spring Data, JPA, and always fetching entities, you are going to end up with a query that selects all columns from all the tables that are being joined. Against a query which uses a custom SQL projection, in this case, it's just we're going to instruct that we only, we're only interested in the version column. Now, when the database see a query like that, it will realize that even the joins are not needed because you can uh, just serve the entire query right from the post comment. It's going to optimize and remove the joins for you. Uh, so if you compare these two queries, you'll see that's a staggering difference between fetching all the columns and just a custom projection. So in the end, you, you, what's important to, to remember is that you should only fetch only the data that you need. The number of data or the amount of data that you need, not more than that. And also, it doesn't make sense to fetch uh, 100 columns when you run the entire business use case requires only 10 uh, columns from that query. So, and optimizing and using projections can actually speed up uh, considerably your, uh, your application. And there are many options if you're using uh, JPA and hybrid. For instance, by default, you have this uh, object uh, array projection. So if you're not, if you're using a projection that has multiple columns, and you're executing a query, by default, those, that projection is going to be uh, transformed and is going to be returned as an object array, which, uh, for instance, you can, uh, you can then consume like this. It's not very nice from a developer perspective. It's not type safe. Uh, the same way it works for native SQL uh, queries. Now, you don't have to use that, that one, the default one. Since JPA 2.0, you have this tuple or tuple I'm not sure what's the proper way to pronounce it. Uh, this, you have this container, which allows you to store the result set based on the aliases of the columns that you used in your, uh, in your SQL query, which can be JPQL or criteria API. So for instance, here you can consume uh, the ID, you can take the ID and just get it by its uh, alias, which is a, a little bit better than uh, using a de uh, than using the default projection, but it's still less uh, let's say it's less e efficient or uh, not as uh, as uh, developer friendly than using, for instance, a DTO projection. In our case, that query uh, wanted to select uh, the ID and the title from the post table, so we can wrap this in a DTO or data transfer object, which is just uh, a plain uh, uh, Java object that looks as follows, it can, has a, it can have a constructor. Uh, in this case, we, we took the number that was intentional because some databases map the big int uh, uh, column to a big, uh, a big, in, uh, a big int integer in uh, JDBC or other databases uh, map it to a long. So in order to accommodate uh, both of them, you can use number and then extract the long value. So if you have this DTO, you have multiple options to to fetch it. For instance, you can use this constructor uh, expression. So in JBQL, you have this option where you specify, after select, you specify new, and then you give the entire class name, the fully qualified name, and then the result, you will see that the result uh, is going to be wrapped in that DTO. However, specifying every time that uh, fully qualified name might not be, uh, might, might not be desirable or uh, you, for instance, uh, I would personally uh, want to reduce that to just the simple class name. Actually, you can do that. I have this project called Hibernate Types, 
which and you have there you have the, that option you can use the class importer integrator and if you use it you can specify multiple classes which are uh, going to be registered by hibernate so afterwards you can use uh, the simple class name so this query the previous query can be rewritten to to this so you can only specify now you can specify the simple class name and let's uh, let's see how it works so exactly as i told you this is the project uh, that uh, this this is the high performance Java persistence project. You have it. Uh, let me one second. Just lower this. So here, let's just go to that uh, previous. So we have this import. Exactly like I told you, you have the option of specifying this integrator here. You can specify it like that, or for instance, we can specify also as a property. You can specify it like that. Okay, so let's see what happens if we comment this. So if we're removing this and our query tries to select, to execute the select statement without specifying the fully qualified uh, uh, class name of the DTO, you will see that when you're running this query, is going to fail because uh, it doesn't know what that post uh, DTO class means. One advantage of using the simple class name would be that you can change the location of the DTO from one package to the other and it's still going to work. Otherwise, you will have to always remember and uh, run uh, uh, and change all the queries. So here, let's, uh, let's see how it works. We uncommented that importer, so of course it doesn't work because it tells that it's unable to locate this uh, post uh, DTO class. So now let's just uncomment this. So now we're going to instruct Hibernate to use this class import integrator, which uses this post, registers this post DTO. So now when we're rerunning this, uh, this test, you will see that uh, it's going to work just fine. So this is, you don't have to actually uh, write any code here. You can just get it from uh, the Hibernate types project, which beside that, so yes, now it works, uh, it works just fine. So it's much uh, easier to use. So just because you have it like that in, uh, in the JP specification, you're not limited to using it like that. Uh, you can just uh, uh, change it and you can even change. It's quite custom, uh, customizable. For instance, you don't have to use this. You can specify uh, that and then you can specify in the importer how you register it. For instance, you can, you can just take and drop a certain uh, part of the fully qualified name so that you use some uh, packages. So maybe in that case, you could have multiple post DTOs, but in different uh, packages uh, if you want. So that's another option that you have for DTOs. Other option is to use this SQL resource set mapping. Now, it's unfortunate that this only works I, uh, only uh, via annotations, you cannot do it uh, programmatically, which I would prefer, but you can still achieve the same goal. For instance, you can specify here the DTO and how, what are the columns that you are uh, going to map to this DTO. And then you can uh, define a query like this, uh, where you specify the query and the previous result set mapping is going to work uh, and you're, you're going to get the same, uh, the same results. However, since Java 14, uh, since Java 14, you also have the option of using uh, records. So I'm not sure how many of you are using this. Probably uh, not many of you use it in production, but at least it's a good idea to to keep an eye on what's being developed. So that uh, it was a, it was also a Reddit uh, a Reddit thread about this, and I wrote an article about Java records, and I told that this feature is not meant to be used as an entity. You cannot use this for entities because entities are designed to be mutable. That's how it was designed to work with them. On the other hand, Java record is an immutable, uh, it's an immutable class that's being generated by Java. It has the equals hash code to string and it doesn't use the standard uh, Java bean uh, naming convention. But for instance, you can define the record like this. It's called, let, let's call it post record. It takes an ID and it takes a title, and then you can run the query. For instance, we, we can register with this class important integrator, and we can just select and provide the record, and then we can we can consume the values. As you can see here, uh, for the ID, 
property, you get an ID uh, methods to consume it and a title for the other one. And actually, you can uh, you can see how this works. One second, to you have here in Git, for instance, there is another branch. No, one second to open it. I'm going to open source tree. So actually, you can uh, you can see how it works. In um, there's another branch that I have in this uh, repository. By default, the master is set to work on Java 13, but you can uh, switch to um, you can switch to Java 14 and you can run it. So until it starts this source tree, uh, we can uh, we can continue. I'm just going to show you afterwards. It takes more time. Okay, so we can continue. I'm going to show you a little bit afterwards. Okay, so what of the one, uh, the last option that you have for DTOs is this Hibernate uh, result transformer. Now you shouldn't uh, be scared that the method was uh, set result transformer uh, was deprecated. The reason it was deprecated is because the transformer, the result transformer. Uh, after Java 8, uh, it was envisioned that it's much better to have it as a functional interface so that you can use lambdas. And that's the reason why in Hibernate 6 is going to be changed to something like, uh, to, to, to something like that. Uh, however, it's still a very useful, uh, it's, it's a very useful feature that you have in Hibernate as uh, you will uh, soon see. So how it works. So exactly the same way like we had this post DTO uh, constructor expression, you can just, uh, use it with um, use it with the result transformer to, to to get the dto now in this case it doesn't uh, it will not use the constructor it, it's going to use the setters so you'll have to keep that in mind so you can actually uh, get it using set result transformer and then use this alias to bin method and it works the same for jpql and native sql queries now for standard and simple dtos that's not very uh, let's say and not very useful. However, what's important and what's interesting about it is that you can fetch hierarchies. So you can have, you can fetch a, a one to many DTO uh, projection that is going to be assembled as a graph. So in the database, you have this one to many table relationship where the child is the post common, having a post ID, foreign key uh, linking to the parent post uh, entity. So you want to fetch this. For instance, if you if you uh, are issuing an SQL query which selects from post, does a join, and then you will see this is a standard uh, query result set where uh, the output is uh, uh, it's in a table uh, format. So the parent is going to be duplicated or is going to be repeated for every child that you have, and you have three uh, three uh, records in this uh, result set. But you don't want to consume it like this because most of the time you want to consume it as a graph. Either you are sending it as a JSON, or you are uh, going to um, consume it in an object-oriented programming uh, as a graph of objects. So you don't want to have it like a, a result set. So what can you do? Actually, you'd want to have it and fetch something like that. You have a post DTO which has a commons collection, a list of post common DTOs. So you want, uh, exactly uh, j j just in the same way like uh, you'd have when uh, when you are fetching entities so how we can do it actually it's very simple in hibernate you have this option of using uh, a result transformer where from this particular uh, query result set for instance the result transformer has this uh, layout so it has two options the first one transform the default projection the tuple to you can transform it to whatever object in our case it's going to be a post dto object and the last method, the transform list, gives you the opportunity of changing the final collection that is being returned and uh, do some extra transformation, which is useful because in our case, we want to return a distinct, a distinct list of uh, parent DTOs. Because if we don't do that, uh, you are going to have multiple copies of the parent entities because they are repeated for every uh, child. So the first thing, we're just going to use a utility which builds a map between the column aliases and the column uh, ordinal or the position in the result set. And then this is our post DTO. We're just going to use some aliases there for uh, that match the column aliases we use for the query. 
And then in the constructor, we are going to use the tuple projection to extract the data and initialize the DTO. The same way is for the post common DTO. Now, to glue everything together, uh, that, uh, that happens in the post DTO result transformer. Using this uh, map alias to index, uh, we are going to first, we are going to fetch the post ID, which locates the parent identifier. Why? Because having the parent identifier, we can use compute if, if absent, uh, which is a method that was being added to map uh, since Java 8. So actually, we're going, we want to fetch the post DTO it was, uh, if it was created before. Otherwise, we're going to just simply create it. Now, we want to do that because we don't want to re uh, recreate the post DTO every time, um, every time uh, we have a new child, a new post common. So we want to create it only once. So we can uh, do it like that. That's exactly what we want to return also from this transformation. However, because we also have the, ch the children, the post common DTOs, we just, for this particular post, we're going to just uh, inject the post uh, common DTOs. And the last thing that you need to do uh, is to just uh, take the values, which is a unique list of post DTOs, and uh, return it as an array list. So as you can see, for, for the first two, uh, you are going to get something like that. You are going to get a post DTO, with, uh, that contains uh, the two child uh, post common DTOs. And for the third one, we are going to just get one post DTO with a single comment. So it's much easier to consume uh, everything like that. So exactly like I told you, this is, uh, uh, you, you can find, uh, you, you can find uh, everything here. So uh, let's see how it was called. So that was called post DTO result transformer. Post DTO result transformer. So basically, this is this is basically the class that we have. So here, let's run the test. Here you can see that. Uh, okay. So for this query, we apply the post common transformer. Let's run the debug here. You can see how uh, it looks. So actually, this is a quite uh, powerful uh, mechanism that Hibernate offers. Of course, it's not the only one. You can also extract, you can also use get result list and just get the uh, tuples or get the default projection, and then you can use streams in order to do this transformation. It is much easier, for instance, if you get everything, as you can see here, you see I'm, I'm having the post DTO and the post commons are being uh, returned uh, right from the query execution. So this works actually in the same way like join fetch works, which you have it here. But the difference between using entities and DTO is that if you're using entities, you are going to fetch all the data that's inside those entities. And using the DTOs, you are going to fetch custom projections. So it's going to be uh, much more efficient to do so. Okay, before we go to the next one, because we also have to take a break, I'm going to answer some questions that you put here. Let's take from the bottom to top. So what's the difference between fetch first and limit statements? So there's absolutely no uh, no difference. If you're using limit, for instance, in Postgres SQL, uh, you get the top end query, you're going to limit the same uh, result set in the same way, like um, if you're using uh, fetch first, which is just another way, it's the standard uh, pagination. What's the Spring way of doing result transformer? It's exactly the same way. So for instance, when you're using Spring Data JPA, you're actually using JPA, but then from the entity manager, you execute a query and then you can just unwrap. That's exactly how I did it here. So if you take a look on the code, actually that's exactly how I'm doing it too. I'm using the entity manager, I'm executing the query. At this point, I'm having the Javax persistence query, which I'm going to unwrap it to query and then apply the set result transformer, which is a method that belongs to the query interface in Hibernate. This is a, this is a, oh, it's a long one. It's an interface that belongs to Hibernate. That's why uh, you don't uh, see it. So here, if you put F control H, so you can see this is a Hibernate uh, query interface. Okay, so some other questions. Uh, one second. Okay. 
Are there any advantage of using a view in order to select some columns of a single table? And how about, you can also use a view if you want, but uh, actually that's the equivalent. Uh, it's exactly like a query. So why create a view when you can simply uh, create, just define the query? One advantage would be only if you're using materialized view, but that's uh, another uh, discussion. Set result, transform, uh, set result transform is deprecated. Yes, it's deprecated. There is no, uh, it's unfortunate that it, it's been deprecated because usually you try to deprecate something in order to provide an alternative to use. In this case, there is no alternative. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, unfortunate that it was deprecated. Now, people usually have a red flag. If something is deprecated, they never use it. In this case, uh, it's not the case. Actually, it's quite useful. Yes, it's going to be changed in Hibernate 6, but it's not known when Hibernate 6 is going to be emerged. And you can simply use it uh, until you're moving to Hibernate 6. Uh, you're, sa uh, you're quite uh, safe to use it. And even if you're moving to Hibernate, uh, to Hibernate 6, probably the migration is not going to be that complicated for this result transform. Where can I get the three JPA DTO projection project? It's, it's this. Uh, on Git, it's on GitHub. Is this project on GitHub? It's Vlad Mihalcha is my name, and then the name of this course or my book, High Performance Java Persistence. That's everything that I'm showing. Uh, it's uh, exactly in that repository. What will happen if you have multiple DTO with the same name? You can use exactly like I told you. You can use uh, you can customize the class import uh, integrator. You can customize in order to remove a certain uh, a certain part of the package name so that you use package some let's say uh, a given package and then the DTO so you can customize this you don't have to use the default uh, uh, the default one how to know the max page number yeah you don't really need to know the max page number mm -hmm. usually uh, that's if you take a look in Google if you're searching something in Google you'll see that the query is limited to max maximum 15 or 20 pages usually people tell you that no, we really need to have all the pages. No, you don't really need to have all the pages. What you need is better filtering criteria. Most of the time, uh, if, you, if you want to search freely and fast, uh, you don't really, uh, you, you might not even use a database. You, uh, in our case, when we developed uh, at wovi.com, the largest real estate platform in Finland, and we used, uh, we actually we used uh, Solar, which is like Elasticsearch, to do the pagination and you don't really care about the pages anyway because if you want to filter uh, and restrict the result set even more you you provide better or more restrictive filtering criteria in the same way you are using uh, in google so for instance if you're doing a google search and let's take google let's just take on google's and oh google com so here in google if you try to just search for sql you will see that you have 385 uh, millions. But if you go towards the end, you will see that you don't have all the pages because it doesn't make sense to have all the pages. So basically what you are interested in, you are interested when, when you see something like that, most of the time you don't even go to the second page. So what you want to do, for instance, SQL Server latest version. So you try to restrict the, the uh, searching criteria in order to find what uh, you are interested in. Okay, so I think let's let's take a break because we have uh, let, let's take a five minute break and then we can come back and uh, continue. And I will uh, I will uh, answer some questions and then we can uh, continue with the next uh, with the next topics. Okay. All right, in the meantime, let me fetch that.
Okay, so let's see if everyone is back. So query cache can be used with DTO projection. Yes, you can use the you can use the query cache in the same way with uh, DTO projection. So if you're using a DTO projection with the query cache, actually you are going to see uh, you're going to store in the query cache the dehydrated or that object uh, exactly like the object array is being uh, is being fetched. Is there a way to see the performance of each query? Uh, with Hibernate now, uh, you don't. The performance of the query of Hibernate mm -hmm. is actually uh, it's it's not something that you see in Hibernate. It's something that you see in the database. So the answer is actually you need to run, uh, explain, analyze, or you need to see the execution plan in the database in order to see uh, or in order to see what's how how the uh, how, how the query is going to perform. And you have to do it on on, on the same. Uh, or for, for instance, in a database engine that is similar to what you're using in production, probably a QA server, which has the same data and statistics in order to get uh, exactly the plan that's be, that runs in uh, production. How does doing JPA do in your unit test? Oh, well, th those are uh, integration tests and actually what it does, uh, it actually creates a new entity manager from the entity manager factory. It creates, a starts a transaction, executes that lambda and then at the end it uh, commits the transaction and closes the entity manager so instead of doing all that verbose code i just use the template method to uh, for that do you recommend to use CRUD repository or jpa repository well if you're using jpa it makes sense to use the jpa repository the CRUD repository is just the base class for it uh, is there any advantage using projection or dto for fetching data instead of entities? Yes, actually it's much more efficient to fetch DTOs. If you're having a read-only view, it, uh, it's much more efficient to fetch uh, the DTO than to fetch the uh, than to fetch the entity transaction. Okay, so one, uh, one second, I'm going to just uh, uh, drop the changes I have here. I wanted to show you how it works with Java 14, but I'm just going to uh, remove it and just switch back to the master because uh, we still have some tests that we want to, to run. Okay, so now let's go back to the master, onto the master branch. And I'm going to run in the background this, and we can start. So we were, uh, we discussed had this projection for tuple DTOs and Java records. Actually, there are more, much more interesting things you can do. For instance, you can have hierarchical data. For instance, if you know Reddit, in Reddit, uh, you have posts and then you have comments. Each comment, uh, each comment gets uh, upvotes or downvotes. But then you don't display uh, everything uh, in Reddit. Uh, you're mostly interested in the top comments. And when they when they calculate this, they they calculate it across an entire hierarchy. So taking, for instance, in this case, the total score for this comment hierarchy is six plus two plus two plus one then you get the next hierarchy so and so so we want to uh, you you want to uh, actually extract and sort the data based on their entire uh, comment hierarchy so how can do that uh, the database layout is simple you have the post and then the post comment also has uh, has a post id of course because it's associated to a post but it has a parent id so you can have a comment that uh replies to other comments so you have an hierarchical structure uh, in your database now what we're interested in here we want to let's assume that we want to build uh, an application which is exactly like reddit and by default we want to display the first three post comment hierarchies based on their total post comment score not just individual that their total scores so you have to calculate it in such a way that the total score belongs to one hierarchy then you go to the next hierarchy so what options do you have? So for instance, this is the data now we have in the database. So for this hierarchy, uh, we have this score, then we have the next hierarchy, which starts from five, the six is the, the uh, six and uh, the ID, the row with ID six is the parent of five. Then we have uh, the row seven, which also uh, the parent is five, so and so. So you have uh, multiple hierarchies here. So what options do you have? You can do the, the first and the most uh, uh, natural way of doing is, for instance, if you're using, uh, if you're a Java developer, then all, all the problems uh, that you have, uh, have a solution in Java, of course. So that's your first, uh, uh, the first tool that you're going to, to use to fix uh, all your problems. So 
uh, what you what you can do, you can extract all the data and then uh, aggregate it in the application memory. Uh, first of all, because we discussed about DTOs, it's uh, natural to fetch the DTO for that. What what's interesting here is that we want to build this hierarchy of post common score, so we want to have the total score then calculated based on uh, every child on all levels uh, recursively. So how we can do that? Actually, using a simple query, you're just going to select all the comments for that particular post ID that we want to display. We get all the post common scores these uh, these DTOs. Then, uh, base we create this map where we have the post common score and then uh, the ID, uh, the um, <laughs> the main ID that we want to process, and then. The first thing that we need to do, we need to do the filtering because we only want to pick and to return uh, the root commons. We don't want, we want to have the root commons return and then we want the ch uh, children to be applied on each level recursively. So how we can do that? You can do it with stream with using filtering. First, you, you verify whether this post common score is a, uh, is a root. If it's a root, you of course are going to uh, include it in your uh, in your final uh, result set. Otherwise, if it's child, you're just going to append it to, uh, you're going to append it to its parent, which uh, actually it's a simple method that looks like that. And then you're going to sort based on the total score, which is calculated uh, recursively on every level. And then at the end, you're just going to limit this stream to a number, in our case, the ranking is three, and you're going to return the list. So it's actually very easy to implement. Doing this, it will not take you a lot of time, and you can test it, and you will see that uh, it works quite nicely. So most likely, this is uh, the number one solution that you're going to apply to, or the first solution that you envision in order to apply or, or to fix this, to solve this problem. But the thing is, do you think that you can do this, what I'm discussing, this exactly this stream processing task can you do it actually with using just plain sql and of course you can do it uh, the first thing that you need to do you have to uh, do the same thing that we did using java streams we have to ex uh, explain that in sql so first we would need to take uh, the roots the roots because basically uh, we need to locate uh, first of all we need to locate them because then we have to go to the next level that's simple we can just fetch the post commons having the parent id null the second level is also simple to fetch because knowing now that we have the uh, the parent uh, rows we can just join uh, the the parent rows we can just join and uh, take the records which have the ids of the roots so now we can locate the second level but that's pretty much it because in order to get the third the fourth the fifth level we would have to know in advance and build the query in such a way that uh, we know exactly where to put the uh, union all for that. And that uh, would be complicated to do if we didn't have something uh, in SQL that allowed us to do, uh, some, uh, to do that. And luckily we have, it's called recursive common table expression. So how you do it? You write your query, uh, it's, a, it's a common table expression because it starts with width, you define the table, and then you define all the columns that it will contain. This is going to, be, uh, it's called, it's built recursively. Actually, it's not recursive, it's iterative. It's, it's going to build uh, one level after the other. The first level is the one containing the, the roots because the parent ID is now. And then that's called the anchor member. The second, the recursive member is going to go from the second to the nth level and is going to join, is going to fetch from post common and is going to join with the already uh, fetched uh, levels based. So the parent on these post commons are going to link the previous ones. So we're going to go with the second, the third, the fourth level, so and so. Why we want to do that? Because we want to pass and have the root ID. So we want to embed and include a new column called root ID uh, in order to know which rows belong to, to which uh, roots. And in the end, you're just going to do the projection query and select uh, the rows based uh, on all their levels. So how it works, at first you are going to select the roots, then you are going to take the second level, then you are going to take the third level, and so on. So basically we have this root ID now. Now we know all the rows to what root or roots they belong to. So based on that, what we can do, we can use a window function which calculates 
based if we partition all the rows by the root ID, we can calculate the total score exactly like we calculated the total score using streams. Now we are using a window function and not a group by because the group by it's it's a it's a reduce it's like reduce on streams it's a, it, it squashes the result set to a single row per partition but we don't want to do that we just want to create a new column without destroying the result set so we're using a window function which calculates the total score per root id based on that root id so we can see that for this particular root id we'll calculate the total score and then for the next one for the next one so and so so we have now we have the total score so what we need to do we need to assign a rank based on the total score so we use a new uh, window function which is dance rank and we are going to order descendant uh, in a descending uh, order by the total score and we are going to assign uh, a ranking like one two three four five what uh, groups of rows of comments are the first one then the second one and so and so so we're going the first one which has the highest score takes the rank of one then the other one takes the rank of two so and so so now we we have all of them uh, sorted so we can just have another query that takes uh, the first three ranks and then we just uh, output everything so we take the first three ranks and we get the same outcome that we had previously using uh, stream processing so this is how your query is going to look at the end so it's actually the i took that stream processing and I translated it into SQL. It looks it looks frightening when you're looking at it uh, like uh, like that. But if you're uh, if you split it using a, a, a common table expression, it's much easier to read because you read from top to to, to the bottom of the query. So now the question is, which one do you think it's uh, more efficient? Is it the SQL level approach or is the application level approach? So you might think uh, that maybe one or the other. So if you put it to a test, you will see that if you don't have a lot of data, actually the application level processing is faster. And uh, it's easy to understand why, because you don't have a lot of uh, data. Actually fetching only 20 records is just one page that you read and you put it on the network. And then the whole streaming, uh, the stream processing uh, task that happens in Java is quite fast. It works even faster. Then the query which is a little bit more complicated to execute by the database but then the more data we have the more time it's going to take for the application level processing because now the moment you saturate your io i whatever uh, io resource is saturated first it could be the disk it could be uh, the networking uh, when you saturate it then you have queuing and then that's uh, that's uh, the bottleneck that you have in the system. So now the more data you're going to fetch, the more time is going to take. On the other hand, the data uh, processing uh, happening in the data, uh, the data processing, the SQL processing uh, task is going to uh, work faster. So in the end, you have to know in advance how much data you are going to um, process and you have a lot of data, then it makes much more sense to just do the processing in the database instead of moving uh, gigabytes of data from database to the application just to do the processing there because it's uh, much easier from the application developer perspective so you have to to keep uh, keep that in mind okay so let's see if we have some questions before we before we start to the next uh, to the next presentation okay so which database is faster oracle or mysql well uh, it's quite obvious that Oracle is faster than almost uh, all databases that uh, that you will run to. It, and it, it depends on what is faster. If it's about processing data, yes, of course it's faster. If you go to a bank, most likely that they are using Oracles and they are processing billions of records in milliseconds. And it's quite difficult to do that for MySQL. But then MySQL was not designed to do that. MySQL was designed for for web to doing uh, um, to use a cluster index to fetch a small subset of records based on their IDs. So they were designed for different use cases. So it's like comparing apples to to oranges. I used a few times recursive in SQL and resulting into slow queries. Are there any improvements? Well, it depends. If you're using, if it was slow, maybe it was slow because you're using PostgreSQL, some older versions of PostgreSQL. Now, if it 
if the query is slow, it's not slow. Uh, is is not uh, entirely slow because it's recursive. Uh, you have to take a look whether if indexes are used, uh, whether the indexes are used for filtering and also for sorting. So you have to go take a look on the execution plan and see why it is slow. Because any query that is slow can ultimately be optimized. So in Postgres, useful when you have millions of records to project is Postgres SQL? Yes, it can use. For instance, there are many uh, applications that have way more than millions of records and they uh, use Postgres SQL and they work qu quite nicely. And the reason why it works like that is because they are using indexing. Maybe they have multiple nodes. Maybe they are using sharding. They read the uh, only transactions go to different nodes. Uh, it's using general Oracle. Yes, Oracle and SQL Server and DB2. Those uh, are used by uh, most uh, most banks. Which database supports this SQL construct? So uh, the recursive C, uh, recursive common table expression is supported by Oracle, SQL Server, also Window Functions, Postgres for a lot of, for for a very long time, and now since MySQL 8. Now you have a common table expression, recursive common table expression, you have JSON functions, you have, so now in MySQL 8, 8.0, 19, 18, 17, 20, they have plenty of features that they uh, implemented uh, in them. So uh, it's quite, uh, the gap between Postgres and MySQL is not uh, that, uh, let's say it's not that big uh, anymore. So now for entities, now we saw, uh, uh, we, we saw these DTO. DTOs are very useful if you have trees, if you need to aggregate data, if you have read-only data, DTOs are ideal to, to fetch data. Now, entities are also useful. They are useful when you want to mod modify data, when you, want, when you want to write data back to the database. And you have multiple options. For instance, you have this find, in entity manager you have find and get reference. Now, few people really use get reference. Uh, get reference is actually very useful when you want to set a many to one or one to one reference back to the parent and you want to persist the child, you don't need to issue a find just to select the parent in order to set the foreign key column value. You can use get reference and use a proxy. Now, because you rarely use uh, JPA directly and most of the time you're using Spring, or nowadays most of the time you're using Spring, the equivalent for this are JP repository find by ID is going to issue a find. And for get reference, you have that me method called get one. So get one actually calls uh, get reference. In Hibernate, you also have this option of uh, fetching an entity by its natural ID. So what's a natural ID? For instance, the email address is a natural ID for a user. For a post, is that slug, which is the, the um, the URL resource after the dom domain name, which of course it's uh, unique. So how you can use it? You can, for instance, select the entity from the entity manager, you can select the post by its slug directly. So what's, how it's going to work? It's going to issue first, it's going to resolve the ID based on the natural ID, and then it will go to, to the database to fetch the record by the ID. You don't necessarily have to execute these queries, for instance, if you're using uh, if you're using second level cache, both for the entity and for the natural ID cache, then uh, you, you will see that uh, no query is actually going to execute. Or for instance, you can use JPQL in the same way, so you can extract the post by slug. It's, uh, it, it's uh, the same thing. Actually, this one can even be um, even more efficient. Or you can use Criteria API in the same manner. If, you're, if you need to build it, uh, the query dynamically, then Criteria API is uh, very nice. Uh, it, it's a very nice construct to use instead of concatenating uh, uh, JPQL uh, uh, fragments and risking uh, SQL injection attacks. Now, because you have entities, most of the time you're not selecting just one entity. Most of the time you're selecting entity and associations. What you need to keep in mind is, is unfortunate. This is unfortunate. Uh, many to one and one to one use eager, the eager strategy by default at mapping time. In Hibernate 3, before JPA 1.0, everything was lazy and it was uh, good. But then uh, when JPA, uh, the, com the JP expert group uh, this, uh, vote, vo voted or decided, they said that uh, it's not okay to impose um, the JPA providers to use uh, proxies for these uh, associations. So they uh, relaxed that requirement. And for this reason, uh, we have this eager fetching for many to one and one to one association, which is bad because why is it bad? 
because uh, in at least in hibernate even with entity graphs you cannot take an eager association and a fetch type eager association association and make it uh, lazy so you're stuck with that that's why it's better to use lazy so uh, by default if you're doing like that so if you declare your many to one or one to one association without specifying a custom fetch strategy then it's going to be an eager association so every time you are selecting the post comment uh, directly using find Hibernate is going to issue also on a left outer join selecting everything for post as well but it's unlikely that for every possible use case in your application you always you are always going to need both the post comment uh, properties and the post properties so and this is unfortunate because you are you, you cannot change that you are always going to get that info even if you don't need it for instance, if you're executing a JBQL and you forget to join fetch the post uh, because the association is eager, the first query is going to be executed without to in order to now for collections is even worse for instance you, you can have this fetch type uh, uh, eager you can also set it uh, of course you can also set it for collections so what happens if you have a collection that is set to fetch type eager you are going to see left outer uh, joins there at first if you're using list it, it will not going to work you're going to get a multi-bag exception but if you're using a set hibernate will let you uh, fetch multiple sets eagerly and you are going to see a query like that the problem with this is these two post common and post tag they don't have anything in common so in order to give you a, a result set a tabular result set uh, you are going to generate a cartesian product and that's bad because for instance uh, if you're executing like that uh, you're going to get a lot of records now if you're not using the direct fetching approach or if you're using a collection you're going to override the default fetch plan and now uh, for the first query, you're going to see that you're going to select only the post, but because you have the secondary, uh, you, you, because you have the extra uh, collection which are eager, you are going to see secondary two secondary queries as well, which is a little bit better than the Cartesian product, but it's still uh, not as good as uh, uh, avoiding it altogether. So actually, this is the best default that you have for many to one and one to one. You have to specify fetch type lazy. Uh, explicitly for all these associations and this is a much much better approach this way when you're selecting the post comment uh, you are going to see uh, a single your select query is only going to select from post comment it's not going to join uh, you're not going to join uh, with the post but now if you want to use the post and reference it from the post comment then as long as this, uh, the hibernate session is open it can generate an extra query and initialize it. Uh, however, this can also lead to problems like n plus one query issues, where for instance, you are selecting all the comments and then you are iterating through them one by one, referencing the post. So you're going to see three extra queries being generated. The solution is simple. You, you, you can use a join fetch. Uh, however, the, the n plus one query issue can be, uh, uh, you can replicate it with both eager and uh, lazy fetching so in the same way you can also have it with uh, eager fetching if you having if you use an eager fetch strategy in post common for the post association and you're executing a query like that you are going to see this uh, plus one query issue as well the solution is simple you just have to use join fetch and this will instruct hibernate to include the join and you are going to initialize and extract the association because you further uh, further need it so now you're going to see a single query and you're going to get all the data that uh, you wanted of course if you're using lazy associations and the session is closed and then you want to reference initialized proxies you get this lazy initialization exception so now what you can do in order to overcome that issue you need to fetch all the data while the session or the entity manager is open so what you can do you can use uh, you can use join fetch for the many to one and one to one associations and that will fix uh, your problem if you're having multiple collections you cannot use join fetch because that will create a cartesian product and it's not going to work so if you try to do it something like that in it's if it's a list you'll get this multiple bag exception so if you're using a set 
uh, you are going to you are going to get the data, but as you can see, the end result is just a Cartesian product because you get all the post commons, all the post common count, and then all the tag. So you get uh, all of them multiplied, which can be uh, a huge uh, number uh, of record that you have in the result set, and you don't want to 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 have that. So what you can do, you can actually use two queries. You can have the first query, which for instance selects uh, the post with the first collection, and then you can rely on the, the thing that Hibernate maintains all these entities and they are stored in the first level cache. And if you select again the post using the second collection, it is going, is going to inject the collection in the already fetched uh, um, posts which are already cached. But this is a trick that works uh, nicely. Now here you can pass the post, but that's not going to work nicely on Oracle where, which you, have, where you have a limited uh, a number of uh, uh, entries, 2,000 entries that you can put in the enclose, and the more you have there, the more are going to, uh, uh, the slower it's going to get. Or you can just uh, simply uh, pass the same uh, filtering criteria to the second query, and there's a very good chance that uh, um, the maybe the execution plan is going to be reused, or at least uh, um, uh, if it's not reused, at least Maybe if you have the index here, it's going to work just uh, just as fast. Now there are other ways to address, unfortunately, uh, with this lazy initialization extension. And there are also just like there are good ways, like the joint fetch. There are also bad ways. Like for instance, this anti pattern. And why I'm mentioning mentioning it here is because in Spring Boot, this is the default. You by default, if you don't disable it, you get this uh, open session in view anti pattern. Why it is why it's an anti pattern? It's because it starts the session in the web layer, then in the post uh, service here you have transactional, there you have a transaction and you fetch everything in, a, in the context of a single transaction. But then when you go out of the service, the transaction is closed and during the UI rendering or the REST, uh, uh, REST controller rendering, there you can, the session being still open, you, are going, you can still fire queries uh, to the database and uh, here, because you don't no longer have a transaction, each new proxy initialization will require a new connection. So you have to go to the connection pool, fetch a new connection, uh, execute a single query, then you release that connection, then you proceed to the next proxy over and over and over. And that can actually hurt performance, uh, the performance of your application. So it's not a good idea to use this uh, open session in view. What's good to use is to fetch all the data in the context of your transactional uh, in, the, in transactional scope where you have that transactional annotation using uh, the repository, use join fetch or use multiple queries, fetch just all the data that you need and then pass it uh, to the other layers. Now another uh, anti-pattern you have here is this uh, uh, lazy load node trans. This is a property in Hibernate which if you set it to true, it will work exactly like in Eclipse Link because in Eclipse Link you don't have this lazy initialization exception. And actually, this is even worse than Open Session in View because uh, at least in the Open Session in View, you are going to reuse the session, but you're not going to reuse the connections or the transaction. Here, you're not going to reuse neither the uh, the session or the connection and transaction. So actually, it works uh, even worse. Now, another thing that is also worth mentioning is for instance, you, you want to fetch associations, but we saw previously that we also want to restrict the size uh, of and, and use this uh, pagination. So if you combine both of them using both collection fetching, using join fetch and pagination, it's not going to work by default in Hibernate the way you think it works. Because first of all, when you're executing a query like that, you're going to get a warning which tells you that uh, this collection of fetch was applied in memory and if you uh, check the query you will see that it doesn't use any SQL level pagination. So actually it doesn't use any pagination, just go to the database, fetches everything, assemble all the parent-child associations and then it's going to limit the number of parents. So why doesn't, why doesn't it apply SQL level pagination? It's because you cannot just put a limit clause there because you want to filter here, you want to filter the parents, not the parents and the child, the, 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 the parents and the child combined. So if here, if you just put a limit five, maybe you, you select the first parent with its uh, four 
uh, child and then you, you go to the second post and only extract a single uh, child even if it has two three or more uh, children so that's why you cannot put uh, a limit clause there however there are solutions uh, for this first of all one one thing uh, to do instead of getting the warning you can just apply this property the query fail on pagination offer collection you can set it to true and then instead of a warning you get an exception so uh, actually this is better because it's fail fast so you are uh, being instructed that something wrong uh, is being done so you should uh, take action and uh, use uh, some other math uh, other approaches to to address the issue so here what you can do uh, if you do that of course you are get, you're going to get this exception so for the solution, uh, the solution is simple. You can just use two queries instead of one. The first query is going to get the IDs. So we're going to get the IDs of the post uh, using the, the provided filtering criteria. So now you have the IDs and then you have a second query which selects, uh, which selects the post. It uses join fetch and it gets all the children. But now you are going to pass the IDs that you fetched previously. So actually you split the responsibility. The first one does the pagination, the second one does the join fetch. The reason why I'm using this pass this thing through, this is a, this is a query hint that I added in Hibernate, which pro, uh, prevents Hibernate from passing this thing to the SQL query. Because here this thing means to deduplicate the objects, not to do the these things uh, on the database. And if you don't do that, this thing is going to be passed to the database and this thing is actually going to try to remove duplicates in the database so there are some operations that are going to be done redundantly but it will just slow the query uh, for no particular reason another option if you don't want to do two queries you can also do it with a single query but here you have to use dense rank and you have to you actually you do the join between uh, the post and post common but then using dense rank you're calculating the ranks and then you are picking only the first n ranks. Exactly, it's, it's the same approach uh, we used previously for the hierarchical fetch. And then you have this uh, SQL results that mapping, and in the end, you're using a um, post uh, this uh, custom result transformer to get uh, all the data that you need. So it's uh, exactly the same uh, strategy we used before. Okay. So let's see what uh, what questions we oh we have lots of questions. Could you repeat the point about join fetch? Does fetch type eager do n plus one rather than join by default? So fetch type eager does an n plus one every time you forget to use a join fetch uh, in a in a, in a JPQL or Criteria API query. So if you have fetch type eager and you forget to do uh, you, you forget to add join fetch. Of course, Hibernate uh, is going to select those using secondary queries. So you uh, you get that. Is it better to use entity graphs? Well, I don't like entity graphs. I I prefer to use join fetch because it's much more um, the query is much more readable than uh, using uh, entity graph. That's an option if you're using the Spring uh, Spring Data JPA. Which is the right scenario for using a went one? Well, I don't understand this question. Maybe you can uh, elaborate it. How we can fix lazy initialization on Spring JPA? Well, you can easily using a join fetch or uh, initializing all the data, or even using DTO projection. Sometimes you don't even need to fetch entities. Okay, does natural ID can be composed from many columns? Yes, you can use you can compose it. It's not restricted to a single column. Is there a way to get newly created child identifier after saving parent? Do I have to save parent and child separately? No, you can use cascade to to save both the parent and the children. And after you call flush, uh, the IDs are going to be populated. Can join fetch be used in aggregation queries? Uh, no, because join fetch is a projection, is a join and a projection, and an aggregation query tries to squash that projection, so you cannot use it. Those are distinct criteria. Based uh, alternative of in close, as it always his performance when bind parameters are large. Well. You don't necessarily, just like I told with pagination, you, if you have a very large in, uh, in close uh, uh, syntax, it means that you fetch more data than necessary. So usually you want to, to restrict because you don't really need to have, uh, you don't really need to select uh, thousands of records because those will not even, uh, you're not going to send it to the UI because they, it's exactly the same uh, analogy that I told before. So how do you use joint fetch with multiple predicates? As in join fetch table B on 
ID, BID, ID, and slug test. Usually, you don't you don't do it like that because that uh, condition you don't have to specify because the condition itself is embedded uh, is embedded in the uh, many to one. Uh, uh, in the minute one in the join columns. So you can use multiple join columns if you want, and then it's going to be used automatically uh, by Hibernate. How do you avoid with close not allowed on fetch association use uh, filters? So with close not allowed on fetch association use filters, I don't remember which, uh, where, where this exception is. So if you, uh, if you ask me, if you send an email afterwards, uh, I, will, uh, I will check it, uh, I will check it out. Okay. So now let's uh, let's continue because we don't really have uh, a lot of time. We can uh, I can let, let's see how a stream uh, works as well. So now starting with JPA 2.2, we have support for streams. Actually, uh, JPA 2.2 is is just a minor increment of the JPA specification, which has supports for Java 8 uh, date time and also this new me method called get result stream, which gives you a stream. Which, which you further can use the stream methods like limit, uh, filter, map, uh, uh, or collect. The first thing that you need to keep in mind is that, for instance, if you're using MySQL or Postgres, I told you that by default you are going to fetch all the data. But if you want to use a stream and only limit the first 50 records, then of course you have to use a custom fetch size of 50 in order to avoid fetching more data, prefetching more data, which uh, you don't uh, need. Behind the scene, this new stream, uh, new stream support uh, is not something that uh, required a lot of changes in Hibernate because uh, for 15 years in Hibernate you already had uh, this scroll method. So you, in, you, you had it in a, uh, in a query you could also use scroll instead, uh, instead of uh, screen, uh, instead of uh, now you have stream. So actually stream just delegates to, to what scroll used to do before. So what you have to keep in mind is that you have to, if you're using MySQL, you have to use integer mean value or a custom fetch size using use cursor fetch. And on PostgreSQL, you have to provide the custom fetch uh, size of well if you're using streams. However, uh, let's see how uh, the execution plan is affected. So assuming that you have this post table and we, we put an index on the created on uh, column. So now we are going to use, uh, we're going to use auto explain uh, in uh, in PostgreSQL, and if the query takes more than uh, one millisecond, we are going to get the execution plan for for, for the query itself. So we are going to execute this uh, JPQL, which uses stream. It uses a custom fetch size of 50, and we limit the result set to 50, and we collect uh, we collect all the, uh, the the 50 posts. So if you take a look at the execution plan, you go to the PostgreSQL log. This is where it's located in Windows. You can locate it in the same way in Linux as well or Mac. And you will see that the query doesn't use any, uh, of course, it doesn't, uh, this is the query that we executed. And there, instead of 50, uh, the execution plan tells that a sequential scan was used. So it didn't use the index. And 500 rows were, uh, were scanned. It didn't scan all of them. It only it scanned 500. It's, it's still a lot. And if you take a look, it, it took two milliseconds to, to execute uh, this, uh, this plan. If you try to compare this, for instance, with a query that doesn't use stream, but uses plain pagination, you will see that now the query uses index scan and only 50 rows are being scanned. And now the query doesn't take two milliseconds, actually it takes less than two, uh, 200 milliseconds. So it's uh, 10 times uh, faster. So why, why, why it, uh, it works like that? When you're using pagination, the database knows that you, you are going to use only 50 uh, records. So knowing that it only, you only need 50 records, uh, the database knows that for only 50 records, it's faster to use an index instead of scanning the entire uh, table. If you're using stream, the database doesn't know that further you're going to need only 50 records. So it assumes that you need to scan everything. So for that reason, if you need to consume all the data, it's faster if you're using a sequential scan rather than using an index, which is an extra indirection layer. So that's why you are giving more hints to the database when you're using pagination. So even if you have this stream, you have to be cautious, cautious because uh, uh, there might be use cases when using plain pagination it actually is actually uh, much faster than using this uh, new approach. 
okay so let's see let's see what questions do we have in the concept of web application is it better to use auto increment id or uid for primary key for postgresql okay so the first first of all uh when using auto increment in postgresql that's uh, using serial uh, actually behind the scene is just using a sequence using a sequence and using a, a more compact um, container for the id uh, if you can use a more compact uh, container like for instance using a small int if you don't have a lot of data or using an int uh, of course it's going to be more efficient because uh, why because the index for the primary key the index for the foreign key is going to be more compact than using uid which is 120 uh, 128 uh, bit so of course uh, it's going to be faster to use to use the numerical values is there any advantage using projection or dto for fetching data instead of entity is it better for the hibernate session well yeah it's uh, it's more efficient to to fetch less data than fetching more data also you don't have to worry about lazy initialization exceptions you don't have to worry about uh, n plus one query issues so it's uh, the result is let's say it's um, easier to control and if you don't need to modify data then you don't need to fetch uh, entities order by close is not using spring boot pagination well i'm not sure about that so there's no to avoid n plus one problem you use join fetching query but how to avoid it when you use spring data method query generation but in oh first of all it's not i don't recommend you use using the spring data method query generation because i'm not sure what you are actually trying to save there uh, because using uh, usually queries are not uh, that short so you cannot express them using the method query generation because it will take a very very long method name so you are better off using something like the query annotation or simply using a custom method and just generate the query itself uh, is it faster to do elastic search lookups by id or postgresql well that it always depends uh, if it's uh, uh, if it's if you if it's indexed of course it's faster to just go and if it's just a, a small record uh, it's faster to go directly to the database but for elastic elastic search can be faster if you are going to scan using full text search freely on a very uh, large number of uh, records across hundreds of thousand millions then of course elastic search is going to be uh, faster than postgresql especially for um, for full text scan okay so the last thing that we have on the agenda and this is a lesser known thing few people know about this is the query plan cache so actually how does it work when you're defining jpql the jpql is of course using a dsl it's an it's a syntax it's a grammar that needs to be translated to sql because in the end you are going to execute an sql query parsing the jpql requires grammar uh, and hibernate defines that grammar and of course compiling that to an abstract syntax tree and uh, traversing it and generating an sql uh, query takes time and for that hibernate has this query plan cache to avoid generating it over and over and over for criteria api when you're creating criteria api criteria api generates the jpql which is also translated and the plan is goes to the cache for instance when you're executing uh, that uh, we uh, you asked about the spring data method names those create criteria apis which are parsed generate jpqls and they are parsed to sql now the query plan cache size by default the size is 2048 now it depends on if you're using uh, an application which generates which uses lots of criteria apis which uh, for instance uses uh, many in close uh, queries then uh, because every in query the more you vary uh, the size the more uh, you are going to get create entries in the query plan cache because the query changes because the number of uh, fine parameter uh, changes as well so usually you can say that most of the time you need to use uh, a value for the query plan cache which is higher than the default one which is 2048 uh, the the other uh, option that you have is for the parameter metadata this is used for native sql queries which define the metadata for for the bind parameter values 
because uh, you don't you don't know the type just like you know it for uh, just like uh, you know it for uh, jpql where you automatically know what's what's what are the types both on uh, on what you are referencing and what's coming from uh, in the jpql query so uh, how you can how you can know for sure whether the plan case says uh, is properly set well you, you know you have the hibernate statistics for instance uh, so what you have there in for instance how you can monitor it uh, one second so statistics so for instance uh, by default hibernate doesn't uh, store any statistics but if you want to get the statistics you have to provide these properties hibernate generate statistics and once you set it you are going to get in the statistics this is what hibernate uses behind the scenes one second so that's what you are going to get so here you have plan so you have this query plan cache hit count and miss count so these two variables are very important uh, for us for in this particular use case why they are important because you want to make sure that the hit count is high and the miss count is low. If you have a very high hit count, it means that the query plan cache works nicely. So you uh, you don't have to remove items from the cache to make room for new queries. If you have if you have a, a let's say an equal or an even larger miss count, that it means you have to increase the plan cache size in order to fit more uh, queries there. So the difference between a cache hit and a cache miss, you can view it here in this graph. Here, the value of 5.2 uh, microseconds, it's a cache hit, and uh, the other one, it's a cache miss. So it takes uh, uh, like uh, many times uh, more to to generate uh, to generate the query. And even if this is microseconds, it still adds up. It's, uh, if you generate a lot of queries, it's still going to add up over uh, uh, the course of um, of a day that you are executing uh, these queries. Now, the other one was for uh, for the native uh, SQL query. There, the difference is not as big, but it's still uh, important to size it because it's an optimization that you can take uh, advantage of. So it makes sense to to use it uh, as well. So basically, this is uh, pretty much uh, all the data that uh, we have. We still have uh, some time to to address questions. So let's uh, let's open some uh, some more questions that you have. Is criteria faster or slower than a query in the JPA uh, repository query? So the query annotation that you have le lets you define uh, a JPQL. So of course, passing the JPQL is faster than defining a criteria which has to be compiled to a JPQL and then to be compiled to SQL. So uh, it's always faster to execute a JPQL than a criteria. The advantage of criteria is that you can build a query dynamically, which is not an option for JPQL, so it's a different use case. So you, you would not use criteria by default. Uh, when to use Hibernate second level cache and when to avoid it? Well, you're using Hibernate second level cache mostly if you want, uh, for instance, for scaling reads, you don't need to use the cache because the database already has a cache. So you can just use the replication, you can use follower nodes, you go to a new node, uh, whenever you have more traffic, you just spend more uh, replica replicated nodes. Now, the, the primary or the master node cannot, you can only have only one of them. So using the second level cache to offload the traffic for read write transactions, uh, that's a very good use case for the second level cache. How to optimize performance when you have to fetch data from multiple tables, tables that have a lot of fields and user can change those fields in runtime for the UI. Well, in this case, you can fetch the entities and uh, you can just make sure that you join fetch for the many to one associations and then for multiple collections, you can use secondary queries exactly as I uh, showed you. Are reactive driver production ready? Well, first of all, people, people, whenever they see a new technology, they assume that they can just drop everything that they learned so far, so they can just use reactive. Reactive is useful if you're consuming infinite streams of data. For instance, if you are developing an application like a, a stock market where the, where the, where the, uh, the market changes uh, frequently, consuming that kind of data is ideal for uh, 
to consume it in a reactive fashion. But not all, all applications are like that. There are many, and there are many years from now, we are going to see this use case where you have OLTP transactions and you're modifying a small subset of data. And the advantage of using uh, uh, this blocking JDBC based uh, transaction is that you can take advantage of transactions where you know exactly what and uh, the database ensure that at the end of the transaction, there are certain rules that need to be obeyed in order to commit or roll back the transaction. Where to see the Hibernate statistics? Okay, I'm going to show you exactly where to see the statistics. So let's just uh, let's just take this code. So here, for instance, we have this use case. You have this connection statistic test, and then we generate the statistics. By default, the statistics are going to to be written to the log, but then you can even customize uh, them. For instance, so you can just uh, customize. And in this case here, um, I'm using this uh, custom statistics factory. And then instead of just logging them, now I'm going to uh, use also Codahel metrics or drop user metrics to, for, for, for instance, to um, I'm going to increment the counter for the number of connections whenever connect is, uh, the connect callback is being called. And at the end of the transaction, I'm going to log how much time the transaction uh, took. And uh, how, how that works, because at the end I have this report here. And if I open this statistic report at the end, for instance, when I call generate, I'm going to log the report, and this one use drop, drop wizard metrics. So by default, when I'm running this test that you also have here, you will see that, okay, let's, let's run this test, and you will see that by default, you're, you're going to see some data in the statistics. You can also get the statistics using GMX, and you can also consume them exactly like I'm doing now. I'm using a custom uh, factory to get the statistics and you can put it to drop user metrics, Prometheus or whatever tool uh, that you're using. So here you will see in the logs here, let's uh, make it a little bit bigger. Let's, uh, okay. so let's go to the end. So these are, these are our custom statistics. So here I'm, I'm using Codahel uh, drop user metrics. So here this, uh, this uh, because I'm using this, I'm getting minimum, maximum, percentile values, uh, not just averages. So, and that's, uh, that's um, desirable. Now this is what Hibernate would give you by default. So it just gives you some information like uh, related to connections, related to flashes. So it's not uh, a lot of uh, data. Of course, you can also get it while the, you can also get it while the uh, entity manager is running if you want. So uh, that's another option. But most of, if you want to, uh, if you want to customize it, this is the way to go. You can use this statistics factory. And for instance, you can see I'm, I'm actually uh, going to run debug this time for this test. So you can see exactly when, uh, when those callbacks are called and uh, how, uh, that's the great. That's the greatest advantage of Hibernate because it gives you these uh, hooks, these callbacks that you can intercept and do other stuff and uh, see what's happening in Hibernate. So here you can see, connect was called um, was called by Hibernate, and here we can see another connect is called. On at the end of the transaction, we have this method that is being called. So you can uh, actually use these callbacks to do whatever you want and. Uh, integrate with other uh, systems that uh, that you have okay so let's see what uh, what are the questions we have there are plenty of them should fetch type bigger be deprecated in your opinion you cannot deprecate it it's in the gp specification the ship has sailed there's nothing uh, you can do nothing you can do about it is there any jpql validator so i can quickly check just my jpql against the database well actually there is uh, the validator. Well, in a way, you have a validator because the JPQL is parsed to to a query. If you write if you write an integration test and that fails, you know that the query is not uh, properly written. Is it better to use Hibernate Cache or have an external tool for caching? Those are different requirements. If you're using Redis, is good for storing some aggregates. The Hibernate second level cache. The advantage of it uh, is uh, that you can store uh, it's uh, consistent uh, it knows when uh, changes are happening through hibernate uh, so you can have a smaller uh, inconsistency window between what data is in the database and what's uh, in the cache uh, 
part of your project produces large of our project produces large GPQL query which are never re-executed. Can you tell Hibernate to not cache them? Uh, well, if you are talking about the query plan cache, uh, no, you cannot. Uh, you cannot uh, um, tell it. Probably uh, that's a good uh, option for a new feature to be implemented in Hibernate. Uh, currently, you don't have your only option is to use a plan cache size uh, that's large enough to store your current working set and those uh, uh, those as well. Um, now that's a longer question here. Uh, we run a situation where we have some constraints on the database level and after saving to database, we want to save to Elasticsearch, like in jhipster. However, the transaction might fail in the end on commit. Therefore, we started flushing before doing the Elasticsearch. Okay, so what you can do here, actually Hibernate Search has an integration with Elasticsearch. So instead of using your own solution, you can use Hibernate Search, which integrates with Hibernate uh, ORM, and uh, it actually provides you a way, uh, a way to address this issue related to, to transactions. So you might want to check that uh, as well. Is it okay to fetch JSON fields a string, or there are be better me uh, methods? So you can use you can use JSON if you have. Um, you can actually extract a query from from a query result set. You can actually compute and generate a JSON, and then further use that and pass it, uh, pass it even uh, from uh, from the data access layer to the UI if you want. Um, you can uh, of course you can do that uh, if uh, you don't need to generate DTOs and then. Uh, and then serialize those to to JSON. Um, now, if you want support for JSON, I have I have that in my Hibernate Text project. Uh, but ultimately, you have to use native SQL. Cannot use uh, JPQL for that. Uh, and um, the advantage uh, of using those JSON, for instance, I can give you some example where using them. Use use them when, for instance, we had some data that was coming from a client, so we, it was coming in JSON format. And we wanted to store it, to store it exactly uh, as it came because whenever uh, data processing, there were some problems related to the data, we want to know exactly what data we had uh, in order to show the client that, okay, the data was wrongly sent because this is what you sent and that's why the data doesn't, uh, uh, didn't generate the right data in the application. If using a mapper, map or fields from entity to DTO after fetching, yeah, that's an anti-pattern. Don't use that. Don't you don't fetch an entity and then use something like map struct or dozer to generate the DTO because that like fetching 50 columns only to to remove many of them and return a DTO. If you want to fetch a DTO, better fetch it directly instead of using entities because it's much more efficient to just fetch the DTO uh, directly with the query. How bad is it to use in terms of performance filters in JPQL like parent ID is null or parent ID equals a parent ID? It's not, uh, it's, uh, that's not a problem. Why, uh, why, would that be, um, why would that be a problem? Usually you want to do that if you're using something like left join. If you're using left join and then in the where clause, you're using something like that because if you're not using uh, something like that, then the query is equivalent to an inner join. So that's not a problem. And, for instance, that's translated to SQL and that shouldn't affect performance. Performance is not always about syntax, as it's about what's the logical operations that are executed. So it's actually how the exec uh, execution plan is generated. So uh, it's not until you until you see the execution plan, it's unlikely that you can tell whether this is going to work fast or not. It always depends how much data you have, what uh, uh, what version of that database you are using. Adding a new index will change the execution plan, so it always depends on what uh, statistics you have, what uh, indexes you have, and so and so. Is it a good idea to use Hikari? Yes, it's a great idea. It's one of the best connection pool options you have. So Hibernate Search will solve the problem of consistency. Yeah, that's the selling point of using Hibernate Search, to, to have a tighter integration with, with Hibernate uh, ORM in order to address uh, this kind of issues. Can, you do DTO projection with Spring Data JPS repository. Exactly, everything I showed you, everything I showed you should work uh, just fine. Actually, the only thing that I didn't show you was uh, related to uh, Java 14 rec records. So let's just use this Java 14 branch 
now we just only have to in the terminal here we just have to use clean compile in order to generate uh, all the classes because uh, those were on java 13. Uh, until it does that we are just going to answer some more questions what do we need dto for so i answered this uh, answered this when i um, we had that section you need dtos uh, whenever you have read only transaction read only views like uh, trees aggregations uh, lists or whatever data that you need to display that you don't really need to modify directly entities are useful when you are selecting something with the intent of being modified like for instance you're selecting something in a table and then you select the, uh, the row and then you you want to modify the data of that particular row is it possible, would you like to tell us about query DSL and JPA model gen libraries, like advantages, disadvantages? Well, query DSL, uh, just like Juke, the advantage of using it uh, where, for instance, uh, it has uh, query DSL and Juke allow you to construct, to build native SQL queries dynamically uh, in the same way you can use Criteria API for JPQL. However, for native SQL, that's something that you don't have in Hibernate. So you want to, you can use, uh, you, you can use, it's just not use one or the other. Sometimes you, you need to use both. Okay, so going back to that uh, post record, let's uh, just go back to this, uh, uh, to this example. So here I'm using Java 14. I have these record classes. So now I, I can use these records, for instance, and uh, I can extract, let's see where's the query. So yeah, here this this is all. so I can use this record and fetch it from uh, from from the database exactly like that. So let's just run this uh, re this query. So uh, starting with Java 14 and onwards, uh, using a record, I would say that uh, yeah, I have to I'll have to go here to the logic structure. One second, I have to change it to Java 14 records and go to maven and refresh everything one second to re-index everything and uh, it's going to work so the advantage instead of writing all those uh, dtos that i present you using a record actually is going to be it's a much uh, nicer approach so but unfortunately the only impediment is that uh, you'll have to wait probably for uh, a Java version that has long-term support uh, because Java 13, 14, 15 uh, will not have that. So we'll have to wait for the next long-term support, which is, I, I think it's 17 or something like that. Just like uh, you have Java 18. So here in this case, now we're using Java 14, hopefully. Okay, let's take one more second until this uh, works and it is runs. So is it more efficient to, to find an entity by natural ID or using simple find by JPQL? Finding by JPQL, uh, I would say it's efficient in terms of the SQL statements, but if you're using, uh, if you cache both the entity and the natural, you're using the natural ID cache annotation, then, uh, and you, you can bypass the database, then that might be uh, actually uh, faster. So actually the answer is always, it, uh, it depends on uh, what, if you're using, uh, if you're using the cache or not. So here, okay, so here if you, if you take a look, we selected, actually we have this post records and let's put here. So if you take a look on the post records, let's just take a look on them. So you see this, this is how uh, it looks like. So it have now I actually sel I selected, uh, th this is uh, an hierarchical uh, uh, structure of records, but basically uh, this is the record that uh, was created with Java 14. So that's uh, basically, so what's, let's just take one of the, one of those. And if you, for instance, if you call to string, You will see that you see it has a custom implementation, which by default you you wouldn't have that uh, for a DTO. Actually, you can even over, override that if you want. Okay, so now uh, uh, we still have I, I still have time to 
for for some question here i'm not sure how much time we have uh, from the organizers so that uh, that's a question that maybe uh, castor can uh, answer for us yeah but the field is okay to you uh, let's just try to answer this last three, six questions maybe okay let's uh, let's answer this last six question the first one is there a best practice to keep uh, often used read only entities in memory for faster access well actually it is you can use if you have read only entities you can use the read only cache concurrency strategy in the second level cache so then instead of going to the database you are going to go to the second level cache and you can fetch uh, those or because they are read only if you have read only data caching read only data is uh, very easy you can just store it in redis and every time you're going to load it you know that it's going to be um, it's going to be data that's uh, it's not uh, uh, let's say uh, stale now of course even with read only data you could delete data and you have to make sure that you propagate that uh, to the cache otherwise uh, you are going to uh, um, let's say um, get data that was deleted is it okay to use is it okay to set fetch type eager if you know you need if you know you need the relation almost always well no it's not okay because it almost always is not uh, always so it's unlikely that you always need to fetch it and it's very likely that uh, someone is going to forget to use a join fetch when you write a query uh, and uh, the you are going to see m plus one query issue so no it's not uh, not a good idea to use does m plus one problem also occurs in hql uh, M plus one query uh, issue occurs in HQL or JPQL whenever you have eager fetching, or it occurs afterwards, after you executed HQL, when you didn't fetch the data and you reference it. We store JSON columns in MySQL 8 when we save the entity to the database. Hibernate thinks that the value has changed and execute an update. Yes, that was an issue with, with an old version of Hibernate types and it's, uh, it has been fixed, so you just have to update the Hibernate Types library and it works. Which one is better, Juke or Query DSL Interval Performance? Uh, well, I don't know which one is better. I only use Juke and um, uh, it has good performance. I, uh, I've never used Query DSL, so you just have to try both of them and see which one works uh, best, uh, best for you. Spring Data uses projection as interfaces like post ID. This way, you don't need to use constructors in Query why not use it and use DTOs? Well, of course, if you have another alternative, you can uh, use that. You don't have to use it. It's just the concept that uh, it's worth using. It's not just uh, use exactly what I presented. If you have other alternative, which works better for you, and you can use uh, the SQL projection and return the projection itself, uh, of course, feel free to use it. Do you think that, what do you think about jhipster projects in regard to how entities are generated? Again, I've never used jhipster project. However, they, I, I've been in contact with them and they try to generate, uh, they try to take into account uh, the advice, the tips that I'm giving on my blog. They, they follow my blog. Actually, they use uh, the tool that I'm uh, building, Hypersystem Optimizer. They're actually using it uh, in order to be notified whether they have some issues. So actually, I suppose that uh, whatever they are generating has been filtered and uh, has been curated so that uh, it's uh, generated as best as possible. It's better to use stream support for JPA when we have to fetch a large window of data. Well, it depends uh, if you have to fetch a large, uh, now it depends on what you want to do. If you want to do processing, it's better to do the processing in the database. If you, if you want to fetch, uh, if you still need to do the processing in the application, then uh, I would say that using pagination still renders better results and using batch processing with pagination than using streams. Exactly for the reason that I showed you related to using indexes. So this is the last question. Uh, what, is, what is the use case for your tool? Do I know, how do I know if it would be worth it for my application? I assume that you're talking about hypersistence optimizer. The use case for this hypersistence optimizer is that it gives you tips uh, about configurations, mappings, uh, session usage, queries. Uh, so it, it gives you tips and actually you can configure it to fail whenever one rule is, uh, is broken. So for instance, you develop your application and uh, someone comes in and breaks some rule, so then you can uh, fail the build. 
So how do you know if it's worth? You have a trial version, you can use a trial version, so you can decide whether it's uh, useful for you. So you have to buy it uh, if you don't uh, like the trial version. The trial version is free, so that's, uh, uh, it's uh, not going to be an issue for you. Okay, so thank you for, uh, uh, thank you for joining this uh, workshop. Uh, uh, I hope uh, you got a lot of uh, uh, tips for your application, uh, for your application that you are developing. And uh, for more details, uh, again, you have the entire code is in on GitHub. You can run all the examples. Many of the things that I presented are also on my blog, so you can just uh, read them. You you have the information also in my book as well. So again, thank you for coming, uh, for joining this meeting, and uh, I hope uh, you like it. Thank you, Mursumes, gracias. <laughs> all languages, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vlad, for sharing all these insights with us. Uh, it's been a great uh, talk, a great session. We received a lot of uh, engagement from the attendees, so thank you very much, uh, also all of the attendees. Uh, I have shared a link of SuriMonkey for, for you uh, to, to, I mean, to give us some feedback about the, the sessions. Not just one, but about all of the virtual sessions, maybe. Um, and please, uh, there will be further virtual sessions. Um, keep in touch with us uh, with our uh, web page and uh, follow us on uh, Universe. Check out the, the other options. Um, subscribe wherever, I mean, wherever you, I mean, if you think is is useful for you. Um, and well, uh, just uh, nothing else from our side. Thank you very much for being here, and we will see you in October, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you everyone and uh, have a good night. Uh, it's, uh, it's night here in my time. So. <laughs> okay, so bye-bye. Bye, cheers.